Hello, my name is Sebastian and I was born and raised in Paraguay, a small country in the center of South America. As most of kids in as most of the kids in the world, I had childhood dreams and aspirations such as becoming a professional soccer player or becoming an astronaut. However, as I grew up, I realized how hard these dreams are, especially when you are from Latin America, a region where there is a huge gap between the amount of talented people and the amount of opportunities to grow. When I was 10, I remember I had a vast collection of encyclopedias in my house. I remember just spending a lot of entire afternoons and devouring them whenever I was not playing with my siblings or at school. I remember just going over the images of the constellations, the stars, the satellites, the dinosaurs, everything related to science in general. I was really inspired. I found them really captivating. And I was really um, looking forward to do more about this outside of the classroom because sometimes in high school was not enough. And I think that happens to a lot of people. So in order to expand these learning opportunities, I think this early exposure to um, information, cool science facts, and uh, fueled my desire to want to go and, and try to do some extracurricular activities when I was in high school. So my first step uh, was to try to find organizations and just events in general that were related to what I wanted to do in the future, something related to space and social impact, the environment, education, those were, those were my main passions when I was younger and there still are. So I started joining just random um, conferences, networking activities and just, or just random events in general that were organized by um, organizations that work in these areas. One of them was the Benjamin Franklin Science Corner which is located in my city. There I had the opportunity to participate and then also lead my own workshops about science in general. So I was able to um, share whatever I was learning there with other kids younger than me. So that was, that was just really cool and really fulfilling for me. But that wasn't all. There I met people who had been studying abroad before. And I found that also really inspiring because and I, want, I, want, I wanted to study aerospace engineering, something related to space, and that was something I wasn't able to find in my country. So, and I developed a, a strong and desire to do that as well. And now I'm here studying abroad and doing what I like and fulfilling my childhood dreams in that sense. And all of that thanks to a scholarship that I didn't know existed before I came here, before I met people that already got this scholarship before I did. So I think just going outside, just meeting a lot of people in general, it's really and helpful to try to find these new opportunities. So I developed this new mindset or this new uh, way of approaching my high school years that gave me a lot of an, an immense academic, social and professional satisfaction. I discovered a lot of a bunch of opportunities and scholarships in general that helped me and grew a lot as a person, a lot as, as a student as well. And what I valued the most about this, all of this journey was that I was able to find people that later became like family for me in different contexts of my life. So what I, I am suggesting here is not that you have to be always super outgoing and and everything. I remember a lot of the times I didn't even feel like going and participating in these different random activities. And, but however, I knew that if I went, I would like, I was most likely going to find someone like a new connection or a new opportunity. And, or maybe at least I would find out that I don't like something. So it was never a waste of time. In order to start your own journey towards finding new ways of connecting with people and just finding new opportunities in general, I recommend you to start doing your own research. And as a first step, I will suggest that you should start with your own, your most immediate surroundings. So for instance, if you like science in general, I recommend you to try to find out if your high school or any local college in your community offer spaces for um, a project in a science fair activity or just any science 
a competition or, or, or event in general. I knew that most countries in Latin America offer an opportunities to participate in science olympiads. There are a lot of them. There are math, physics, chemistry, history, philosophy, astronomy, chess. Um, there's all types of olympiads in general, um, but there, there are also international olympiads. So some of these olympiads offer opportunities for you to go to another country and compete as well in those disciplines. When I was in high school, I had the opportunity to participate in the national and later the Latin American Astronomy Olympiad. There I met just tens of people from all over Latin America who were also really invested into trying to find these new opportunities and try to develop themselves academically in the different sciences in general. So after you did your research about and your most immediate surroundings, I recommend you to also try to keep your ears on the ground, which means trying to always be aware of opportunities and online. So like there are a lot of websites that collect this information about opportunities of like summer programs abroad or conferences, hackathons, just all types of opportunities in general. So I suggest you to use, for instance, if you're from Brazil, there's a very good website called Inspira Sonho that's in Portuguese, it's inspirasonho.com.br and if you, if you would like to access to this information in English, there's also Youth Opportunities or Opportunity, Opportunity Desk. Those are just uh, some of my favorite websites, but um, if you need more information, you could also contact the organization IOAA. They have a lot of, they have a list of a lot of these uh, websites that collect this kind of information. So I highly recommend reaching out to them, trying to find something if you want to find something to do. But let's say you are very unlikely. Let's say that after trying and trying a lot, you still haven't find any. Or maybe you have a very use, you have a very experienced them, you have already found a lot of these opportunities, but you still want to do a lot more. So then I recommend you to start your own activity. Yes, like your own project. It could be literally whatever. So you could start a club of people who like just looking at birds and analyzing their trajectory using calculus or, well, I'm joking, or maybe I'm not. My point is that there are no limits. I have a friend, for instance, from Sao Paulo, Brazil, who was just observing his surroundings in his community. And he realized that there's a lot of people from IT that came to Brazil as refugees and they were in trouble there because they didn't know how to speak in Portuguese. So he decided with his closest group of friends that he wanted to go and teach them Portuguese so that they can have access to academic and professional opportunities. Now, his project is very spread in several high schools in Brazil and, he's having, and his project is having a lot of impact in a lot of people. And, it's of course really fulfilling as well for him. So um, there's re really, really no limits about what you can do by yourself. If you have just a group of friends and time and willingness to do something different, it's really up to you. So finding these opportunities and taking advantage of them is a great habit to build early in life or at any moment in your life. It will help you build not only uh, uh, a greater um, knowledge, but also the motivation to continue working towards your ultimate goal, whichever that is. Well, here uh, in this International Organization of Aspiring Astronauts Conference, I, I guess that most of you also want to be an astronaut, like me. It doesn't matter how crazy it sounds, no dream is too high. There's a stereotype that people who want to be an astronaut, they realize this is just impossible after they grow up, so they just forget about it. But after so many years, I'm, I'm just more sure that I want to do that. And I'm pretty sure you too. Um, everyone can do that. Everyone who really has this flame inside that really gives a lot of energy to try to go reach out to people, just putting themselves out there in discomfort sometimes, but that's fine. That's how you grew up. 
And I believe that my story is not exceptional. I believe that everyone has this passion waiting to be discovered. Everyone has like an inner flame waiting to shine. Guys, we are the Mars generation. The first person who's gonna land on Mars is already alive. It could be any of you. It could be me. It could be anyone who's already working on it. So I want you to ask yourself, how are you spending your time? What are you preparing for? And who are you helping to succeed as well in this journey of life? Thank you very much. Hi everyone, my name is Bailey and I'm so excited to be here today. I just wanted to say thank you to everyone putting on this amazing event. Um, we get to talk about space, so what else could you want? So on that note, I'm gonna share my screen. So what I wanna talk to you guys about is the future of space and how it impacts me and also how it impacts you. So hopefully you guys get some good tips coming out of this. Um, as I mentioned, my name is Bailey Burns. I have a degree in mechanical engineering um, and I am currently pursuing my master's in space resources. I hope to graduate this May, so we're almost there. Um, I'm also an aerospace systems engineer at a company called Paragon Space, where we focus on ECLIS system, which is the environmental control life support system. Um, obviously, we can put rovers on Mars, uh, but when we start talking about putting humans in space, this is crucial. This is how we get oxygen, remove CO2, temperature control, pressure control, water, all those kind of things. Um, we have a contract with Dianetics for the uh, HLS lunar lander proposal, and uh, that's just an example of an ECLIS system, not necessarily the one we're using, but um, it's absolutely amazing to work on. I get to feel like I'm actually progressing humans into the next phase of our history, basically. It's, it's really cool, and similar to a lot of you, um, I am an astronaut hopeful. I would love to go to space one day and through my career I'm doing all sorts of things to help me prepare for that. Um, the most recent being uh, going to high seas and becoming an analog astronaut for a two-week simulated moon mission, lunar base mission, uh, where we explored and mapped lava tubes partnered with NASA Goddard. It was an amazing experience. Um, just getting to be with, with my crew, working on science things is really cool. Um, I also work as a citizen scientist uh, for suborbital space, 
with Project Possum, and I am a uh, Rubik's Cube ambassador, which I know a lot of people are like, that doesn't really fit in with space, but I'm trying to make it fit with space. Uh, I would love to be the world's first space cuber. Um, the goal is to be the first person to solve a Rubik's Cube in space, and if I'm not the first person, I definitely want to be the fastest. So um, that's, that's the bucket list item for me. That's how I know I made it. So let's talk about you, as I'm sure a lot of you are thinking, how do I become an astronaut? Now, I do need to caveat this with a Bailey Burns perspective. This is not necessarily the foolproof way to do this, but um, I just want to line some stuff up for you guys, get some tips, get some of those brain juice going to get, get some ideas going. So the first thing before we really dive into that, it's understanding the industry, understanding the space industry. Now, when we started back in the 1950s and 60s, astronauts were typically test pilots, um, pretty much military only. And um, that was when we were going to the surface of the moon. We needed someone to pilot the spacecraft because we really didn't know what was out there. And we needed nerves of steel to be able to do that. Um, as we've progressed into space into the 70s, 80s, 90s, and modern day with the International Space Station, we haven't been back to the moon since then, which means all of our missions have been to low Earth orbit and they've all been research-based. So we still need pilots to get there, but because it's research-based, you start to see scientists come here, come in. And, and then once we had more people there, it was like, okay, we need doctors coming in to take care of these people. We need engineers coming in. And that's kind of the, um, the way you become an astronaut is through these STEM fields. Now, um, I think what you guys are gonna see as we move forward through this, this is all very important, but we're gonna start opening this up. And as we started with test pilots and expanded it to STEM, you're going to see it's expanding even more. So let's talk about that specifically. As we're going to be building a Mars colony, that's the goal, right? That's all the sci-fi, that's the Martian. Um, everyone, everyone has a place on this on, on this planet, basically, if we're starting humanity over on this planet. So you don't have to be an engineer. Um, it helps, obviously, but there's other places for you. And that's true for as we build these moon bases that we're working towards with Artemis. But you're also going to see people going to suborbital space through space tourism um, and even low Earth gravity in that, or low Earth orbit in that sense. We also have um, a new interest in satellites in terms of uh, cybersecurity, um, networking. We're bringing the world, we're actually making it a smaller place by how easy it is to connect um, through internet and stuff like that. And that's only going to grow. And then we have one of my favorite topics, which is space resources. Um, we'll, we'll get into that one in a little bit, but that's a huge piece of the future of space. So speaking of all this, uh, we've got old space and I'm going to use NASA just as kind of an example of what old space is. There's a lot of other, you know, um, Russia obviously has a space agency that's been involved every step of the way as NASA has been. So you see uh, Russia and NASA really owning um, that low uh, Earth orbit right around Earth. And obviously NASA was the, is the only space agency to put man on the moon. Um, and pretty much space is belongs to NASA and uh, the Russia and all these different um, kind of the big powerhouses. That's the way it's been for a long time. Well, this is new space. It's not just NASA. NASA is involved. We still need NASA, but we also have SpaceX shooting for Mars. Blue Origin's got their blue moon proposal. And then, as I mentioned, low Earth orbit is still a happening place. We have companies like Axiom Space, Virgin Galactic, Fi Firefly, Boeing, Sierra Nevada, all these companies, even Blue Origin still, and SpaceX, they're all looking for things to do in low Earth orbit as we look outward. Um, so it's no longer a government agency, it's becoming private, which is really good for us. But speaking of government agencies, it's not just the US and Russia anymore. We have JAXA stepping up. ESA's got amazing programs specifically in space resources and robotics. Canada's doing great things with robotics as well. And then the Australian Space Agency, which is only just a few years old, but is already making leaps and bounds in the space industry. So it's not the same, the, the world's not the same. You know, it's not just NASA anymore. We've got all these different companies and countries getting involved. And what that means is the future of space is diverse and it is competitive. And we're going to be seeing government agencies and commercial partners. It's not going to be just one, which is very exciting for all of us who've wanted to get involved, but just had different stoppers in the way. They're, those are going to be broken down as we go. And we're going to see um, not just low Earth orbit, we're going to see moon, Mars, suborbital space, maybe even beyond. Um, it, it's about to get very exciting, but as we get excited for all this, 
let's figure out what the goal is. So we are working towards the common goal of a permanent and sustainable human presence in space. That's permanent and sustainable. Uh, there's a reason when we went to the moon in 1969, we haven't been back. It's been 50 years. It's because we hadn't been doing this permanently and sustainably. And it's time for this new wave where this becomes the new norm. Um, and I'm very excited to see this, but we have to keep that in the back of our minds. So um, please be thinking about that. Specifically, as we move into this next topic is you need to figure out your career trajectory. And I, I don't say that to freak you guys out and be like, you need to have the answer right now. You need to be an engineer or a doctor before you turn 20. That's not what I'm saying at all. I'm saying you need to figure out what your passion is. Um, and, and there's a lot of different passions out there. Um, in my career, my passion is space resources, um, specifically the moon. Um, but, you know, I also have a passion for Rubik's Cubes, and, and that could be my way to space. I don't know. So that's my point, is you figure out what your passion is, and, and the rest, the career trajectory follows that. So speaking of that, let's talk about my passion, space resources. Um, I'm going to introduce you to ISRU. This is in situ resource utilization. Well, in situ means in the original place, which means we are using resources in space for space. And I'm going to keep coming back to that. So it's basically the collection, processing, storing, and using res resources found in space for space activity. And this is really, really, really important moving forward because we've been using Earth resources to send us to space, which um, can only last so long because we have humans here on Earth that need those resources. So the point is that we need to do it to get us into space, but once we're in space, we have to start using space to be able to do these things. We can't keep relying on, on Earth. It's kind of like you have to eventually move out of your parents' house and spread your wings. It's very similar to that. Eventually, we have to be using space. And we do that with space resources. Now, now here are the topics I'm going to be talking about. We've got mining asteroids, which if you guys have watched The Expanse, this is, uh, they cover it very well. And uh, we mine the asteroids because there's water and metals. We also have moon resources. I am a moon girl, if you guys can tell by my lovely moon back backdrop there. Um, the moon actually has water and helium-3 and tons of other benefits. Um, we have additive manufacturing in zero-g and uh, regolith construction material, which is a really interesting one. If you look in the bottom right there, that's actually an example of um, of what that, of simulated regolith, moon dirt, um, and what it would look like if we tried to use it as a construction material. It's actually got some really interesting properties um, that you should look into. But let's talk about asteroid mining. Now, for all my entrepreneurs out there, um, they say that, that, that it's predicted that the first trillionaire, trillionaire in history will be an asteroid miner. Um, whoever the CEO of an asteroid mining company, a successful one, is probably gonna be the first person to hit $1 trillion. Um, I think that's a really interesting to think about. So if, if you wanna be that person, you might wanna start looking into asteroid mining. Uh, but we've got water on these asteroids, um, which obviously is really important to humans in space, but we've also got metals. There's tons of metals. There's iron and nickel. Um, it's, it's, you know, iron and nickel for millions of years, which basically, you know, we have the supply of iron and nickel on these asteroids that could support the human population for millions of years. We've got some other rare earth metals or metals that are very difficult to get to here on earth. Um, it's projected that the <laughs> near-Earth objects have, uh, or asteroids, have um, up to $5 trillion of platinum. Platinum, like that's not the most common thing. You don't walk out and pick up a platinum rock and they have $5 trillion worth of platinum on them. That's where that trillionaire comes in. Um, but here's the important thing here is in space for space. Uh, we don't necessarily want to bring all this metal back and just have a bunch of metal sitting here on Earth. We want to be using those, that all the metal from the asteroids to build rocket ships in space, uh, build other space stations, um, all sorts of infrastructure that we haven't even thought of yet. Um, that, that's the point of this, is we want to be using the metals from these asteroids to progress humans in space. Now the issue here, especially if you are interested in getting to asteroid mining, is the technology is not quite there yet and it's very expensive to do. So if you want to become the first trillionaire, those, those are going to be your problems that you need to solve. Now, moon resources. Like I said, I'm a moon girl. This is really exciting to me. Um, we've got water on the moon. People do not realize this, which is fine. It's very understandable. 
but uh, water on the moon, it's not just, it's not just a dusty rock. That's my point is um, there's actually frozen water ice in the permanently shadowed regions uh, like craters, areas that don't really see sun and stay very, very cold. Any sort of water that came from asteroids or, or whatever stayed on the moon. And now we've got a lot of water on the moon. You can see that in this map. That's a lot of water hanging out on the moon, um, it's specifically in the poles. And it's really beneficial for, for humans if we want to go live on the moon because we need water to drink, so obviously we need water. And if we don't have to launch it from Earth and we can use the water on the moon, that's going to help us a lot. Um, the other thing people don't realize about water is it's actually one of the best radiation shields. Uh, radiation being one of the biggest risks we have as we expand into space. We don't quite know how to deal with uh, solar radiation without the atmosphere. So using water to help protect against that is, is a real game changer. Um, we also can use it for rocket fuel, fuel cells, obviously oxygen just for us to breathe. There's a lot of different uses for that. We also have helium-3, which is an amazing energy source. Now, helium-3 is going to start progressing humanity in a cleaner, more efficient energy source um, in, in the future. It's, it's far more close to nuclear energy and um, kind of that idea of fu fusion. And, and uh, if you ask me if we can harness the helium-3 on the moon, which as you can see from the picture on the top left, there's tons of helium-3 on the moon. We have some here on Earth, but not nearly the same quantity that we have on the moon, and it's much easier to get to. Um, so if we can start using helium-3 in space, we can actually start to bring that technology back here to Earth to create a better energy source, um, fixing a lot of the world problems that we see today. Now, as I say that, the purpose of this is in space, for space. So we can use helium-3 to start powering rockets eventually, but until then, we still need rocket fuel. Now, what is rocket fuel made out of? If, if anyone knows, rocket fuel is hydrogen and oxygen. Now, let's think about this. What is water made out of? It's H2O, hydrogen and oxygen. Are you guys seeing this now? It's so cool. So we think we can use the water on the moon as rocket fuel. We can literally just separate them out and have rocket fuel. And this is what led to the in space for space gas station con concept. Here's, here's, here's the game plan, guys. This is what we're thinking. We've got the Earth. We launch from the Earth to the moon. On the moon, we're going to have a gas station. I don't know, what it, whatever you guys use, Shell, Conoco, your local gas station on the corner, that's what the moon is going to become. You can launch off to the moon, refuel your rocket, get some more water and you take a quick break, stretch your legs a little, and then hop back in your rocket and go on to Mars. And it, we can do it more sustainably and more permanently. Remember, that's an important thing. So that is the gas station concept. And why is this important? Because think about it, if you're going on a three day road trip, right? You get in the car, you maybe bring some snacks like beef jerky or chips or I don't know, whatever you like to drink. You probably get some Gatorade or, or an iced tea or something. And uh, you probably have a book or like a game or, or I guess you got your phone anymore, so whatever. But think about it if you had to carry everything you needed with you. That's all your meals. That would be all the gas you would possibly need. Every time you can't stop at a gas station, you have to bring it with you. You would basically need a semi truck for just the three days instead of your car. And that's not sustainable, right? So that's the same thing with what's going on with this gas station concept. We don't want to bring a semi truck with us to Mars. We want to bring a little rocket that can go from the Earth to the moon and then the moon to Mars. That's the concept here. And, and when thinking about the futuristic space travel, I think this is a really amazing idea. All right, the other one that I want to talk about is additive manufacturing. And for those of you that don't know the, what that means, it's 3D printing. Um, a lot of us probably have 3D printers at home. Uh, I don't know if you do or not, but it's a super amazing thing that's really changing how the general public works in modern day. Um, you can start printing things for way cheaper than ever before. And the same is true in space. In space, the lack of gravity is actually a resource for 3D printing. You can often get really, really fine detailed prints that you can't get here on Earth. And then if you do have a 3D printer, you understand the struggle of having um, warping occur or having uh, to create like support structures because if you create over here, you can't create this without a support structure because of gravity. Well, think about it. If there's no gravity, you don't have that issue. So you can print way better pieces. 
um, actually, you know, on the ISS, they're doing this now. Um, they actually, the first tool printed in space was a wrench. That was the first thing ever printed in space. And they used, I think that was in 20, 2018. Um, so this is happening, not just on Earth, but in space. Now, like I said, in space, for space, what can we do? We're looking at using additive manufacturing to begin printing the moon bases and the Martian bases that we want so badly. Um, as I mentioned, we've got that regolith, the, the lunar dirt as a construction material, right? So we can look at using that and actually feeding it through a giant 3D printer to begin printing um, whatever habitat you think we need. So there's a lot going on in this, in this world, right? And this is just space resources. This is just a tiny fraction of what's going on. So let, let's think about this. You need to figure out your passion to find your career tra trajectory. So then once you find your passion, you can connect your passion to what space needs. So, so let's think about what we just talked about. How can you mine asteroids? What's your idea? Is it, I, I, I don't know, you tell me. Is it, do you have some cool drill bit? or maybe it's a really unique concept. Maybe you need to send astronauts to asteroids to mine it. How would you mine an asteroid? Okay, but how would you use regolith to build on the moon? What would your habitat look like? Would you have a dome? That's what a lot of people are thinking, but there's tons of other shapes out there. Do you think maybe it should be above ground or underground? How would you make a staircase? How would you make roads? All of these things, you can start tying it into space. And, and on top of that, what is missing? We, I literally just covered space resources, guys. It's, it's this big of a topic. As we have humans in space, we're going to need doctors to help cure people from illnesses, save people's lives. But we still need bioengineers and bioresearchers and biochemists to tell us, you know, how the human body is acting. On top of that, maybe you really like people in general. You like understanding people. You have that, that connection to people. And in space, it's an extreme environment. It's very stressful. We need behavioralists um, and psychologists to be telling us what it is we're feeling and help us cope with feelings of isolation or, or the vastness of space. We need those people to help ground us. Maybe you're really into the tech side of things and you like computer science. Well, obviously we have robots on Mars and anything we do in space is gonna require a lot of coding. And there's definitely a need for that in space. And we have science communicators. I just went over a bunch of STEM thing, but it doesn't end with STEM. There's so much more. We need people, science communicators who can come back down to earth and be the storytellers to inspire everyone on Earth and explain to them why this is important, what we're doing. Science communicators are one of the most important parts of what we need to do in space. On top of that, we have space lawyers, um, we have space artists, we have, what else do we have? We have space economists, um, we can do just pretty much anything you need in space. One of my favorite stories is the Apollo astronauts, their suits were actually created by your average seamstress. So if you're a stream seamstress, maybe what you can do is start sewing spacesuits for NASA. There's literally whatever you want to do, whatever your passion is, there's a place for it in space. And it's now your turn to get creative and figure out how you can connect your passion to space. Okay, so we've gone through, we understand what's out there. We're starting to figure out what our career trajectory is because we know what our passions are. And we start figuring out how we can tie our passions to space. We're feeling good. We have this big vision. Well, now it's time to prepare yourself. And this is so important, guys. This is this needs to happen right now. Okay, so this picture right here is actually not a picture of any space slide, or I didn't pull this from NASA or anything else. This is basic economics, essentially. Um, what we're looking at here is something, a product, let's say, um, or Amazon or, you know, Tesla or whatever you want to call it, some company. What you're going to see is in the beginning, we've got this, this kind of like, okay, we've got this idea. It's really cool. It's starting to take off. We're really excited. In this phase, it's high risk, high potential. It's unknown territory. They don't really know what the market's going to do. But at some point, they're going to hit their peak. They're going to, it's going to take off and people are going to get very excited about this. This happened with Apple, with the iPhone. Um, this is a very common thing that happens. You have this huge increase and um, it's, it's very exciting, right? Well, then after this initial increase, no matter how big of a product it is, there will always be this decreasing risk phase. You don't want to have high risk 
forever, right? You want to be able to kind of find this middle ground. And so you want to be able to decrease risk. And with that becomes a decrease in the projected value of what you're doing. People might lose interest. Um, other competitors might join and take away. Whatever it may be, every single product will see this decreasing value right here. Now, here's the thing. Great products, great companies will after they hit this little down point, they will skyrocket higher than they ever did before. And I know this chart shows this kind of downtrend again. I think some places they just keep going. They just keep going up. You can't see the end. And, and this is how you know you made it. And I mean, I'm talking like, this is, this is Facebook where, um, you know, people kind of lost interest when Instagram and Twitter kind of happened. And then it took off again, right? I'm talking uh, Tesla. I'm talking... Uh, like I said, the Apple Watch, Apple products, this is what's happening. It changes the industry. TV back in whatever that was, the 19 whatevers, and now it's in every day, everybody's house. This is, this is the game changer phase, if you will. Okay, so now we've got this quick economics lesson. Um, let's put space on top of this as like kind of a filter. So this, this first little phase right here is... 1950s, 1960s, we're sending Sputnik up. We've sent a couple astronauts to kind of come up and down and tell us what's up there. Um, it's really exciting. And then we hit it. We hit that huge potential that this is when Apollo happened. We've got man on the moon. Everyone stops and stares at their TV screen. Everyone in the world, not just NASA, not just a few people, everyone in the world, it falls silent and watches Neil Armstrong take the first steps on the moon. That is this this projected value is high, we're excited, it's amazing. And then it kind of tapers off. When Apollo ends, we've got Skylab. Um, people don't really know we still have a space program, honestly. It's like people forgot. And, and we had to spend all this time here gathering steam again um, with the shuttle era and with the International Space Station. And I think right now we're right, right where that gray and red meet. We are pretty much equal with what's going on with Apollo, okay? We're like, we, we can kind of see Apollo. There's a lot of really exciting things to happen and it is time for us to take off. It is time for us to change the industry, change the world and just have this exponential increase to where space is common. It's in everyone's household, people are excited for it and this is the future. And I'm saying this because this happens, this is an economics thing and it's applying to space. That's how you know that this is gonna happen. Right? Well, here are some of the issues with that. It's expensive. You have to get the public to buy into it. There's a long term return on investment. It's hard to get people to want to spend money on something where it'll take years to see the profit from that. Technology is not entirely where we need it to be, and humans aren't really ready to go to space. Well, that's my point. You need to get ready to go to space. You need to prepare yourself because this. This is happening, whether you're ready or not, this is going to happen. And if you're ex excited for space like I am, you need to start getting yourself ready so that when it happens, you can jump in and be a leader in the industry. Now let's talk about in terms of becoming an astronaut, how can you do that? You need to educate yourself. Now, specifically to become an astronaut, I recommend you have a college degree. Uh, if you wanna go the traditional route with private industries coming up, who knows if that's gonna be true five years from now. But in general, college degree helps. Um, and actually looking beyond that to master's and PhD. But when I say beyond, I don't necessarily mean that. Like I said, who knows if a college degree is going to matter in a few years. The beyond comes from a thrill of learning. You have to be a constant learner to become an astronaut. You have to be inquisitive. You have to say, hey, I don't understand how this works. Let me go figure it out. And you know what that looks like? That looks like YouTube. That looks like Google. You can do it on your own. You don't need a professor standing in front of you to figure things out. You can get together with your friends and piece it together. And that kind of excitement for education and learning is what you need to be an astronaut. You also need to train in extreme situations. Space is stressful. It is, space is trying to kill you every step of the way. If you mess up in space, it, it's trying to kill you. This is an extreme situation. You need to be doing things to train yourself for that. For example, what I did with high seas, with Project Possum, all these things in high stress situations is going to benefit me if I ever get to become an astronaut. 
Uh, and, and these extreme situations can look different for everyone, um, but you need to be pushing yourself uh, and excited about pushing yourselves. And, and with that, you need to explore, which is my next one there. Um, keep exploring, whether that looks like hiking, um, scuba certified, I would love to get scuba certified one day, um, getting your pilot's license, or maybe even on a small scale, maybe it's walking around your block, um, maybe it's exploring a new bookstore, or maybe it's talking to someone new um, and, and exploring what that kind of human relationship looks like. You just have to keep exploring and keep being curious, however that looks like for you. And finally, this one, I think it's not necessarily you have to do this to become an astronaut, but I'm going to say you do because this is my perspective. You have to connect and give back. Astronauts you never, you will never see an astronaut who said, I got to space by myself. There are thousands of people back home working on ground support. There's the engineers that built the, the rocket. There's all sorts of stuff going on and it's never just one person who did it. So you have to be able to connect to your, to your network and be able to give back to that, whether that be um, talking to people, inspiring people and getting everyone excited to moving into space. That's what we're looking for. Finally, and this one's the most important to me, you have to make it fun. That's where the excitement for learning comes in. That's where the exploring comes in. That's where the connection comes in. And that's why you have to find your passions. You have to make it fun. That's why I want to bring a Rubik's Cube to space because at the end of the day, I think that would be super fun. And whatever that looks like for you, um, maybe it's doing a backflip. I think, I think doing a backflip in space would be so much fun. So there's a lot here. Um, it's not as hard and scary as you think. You get to have fun. You get to treat it like a game and explore and figure out what your passions are and how it ties into space and just get ready. Be, be ready for when that opportunity presents itself. Now I'm going to end with one of my favorite quotes. Um, this was set in 1984, so, so a long time ago. What is that, 40 years ago from now? And it still holds true if you ask me. This is, if God wanted man to become a space-faring species, he would have given man a moon. I think this is really beautiful because I don't know if you guys have noticed, but we have a moon. Um, and as I said, the moon holds so much potential for getting us to Mars and farther. So I agree with this wholeheartedly. If we want to become a spacefaring species, we need to use the moon. And because we have a moon, anything's possible. There's nothing holding us back from becoming a spacefaring species. And I'm just so excited to explore that all with you. So on that note, I will, I will end this presentation. Um, I hope you guys are as excited about the future of space as I am. Um, and if you have any questions, always feel free to reach out to me. I obviously love talking about space. Um, and if there's anything else I can do for you guys, um, let me know. But on that note, I think I will head out. And I just want to say thank you guys uh, so much for this awesome opportunity. And I hope to see you guys in space. Bye.
Hello, my name is Crystal Horton. I am an aerospace engineering undergrad. I'm also a systems engineering intern for Lockheed Martin Space, as well as a Lockheed Martin Space intern ambassador. A little bit more about myself. I'm 19 years old and I'm a Mexican American who was born and raised in Southern California. And I now attend the University of Colorado Boulder studying aerospace engineering with minors in electrical engineering and leadership studies through the president's leadership class. Today, I'm gonna to be sharing my journey in STEM so far in my career. I think this is really important because everyone has their own journey um, into STEM and for me into aerospace. And so I enjoy hearing other people's journey into the field. And so today I decided that I would share mine with all of you. To start, the top two pictures show my father. He was a high school physics and chemistry teacher and is really the person who sparked my interest into STEM. He'd bring home science demonstrations and do them with my brother and I in our living room and really gave me early exposure to STEM. We would go to various science museums. As you can see in this picture here, um, there are many science museums in Southern California that we would go to regularly. And this really allowed me to further engage with hands-on STEM activities. I was also very interested in space and becoming an astronaut. So we met many astronauts, including astronaut Buzz Aldrin here in this bottom left picture, as well as astronaut Sally Ride in the bottom right. I also learned that I love robots and robotics and toyed around with Lego Mindstorms kits. And if you've never heard of Lego Mindstorms, I highly recommend looking into it. They are simple kits and they allow you to explore engineering and computer programming with these interactive robots. All of these events occurred while I was in elementary school, which for me was grades kindergarten through fifth grade. And all of the things listed on this slide are aspects that I carried into the next chapters of my life and things that helped motivate me as I go further in my education and further into my career in aerospace. The first one being that I want to be an astronaut and I'm willing to do anything and everything it takes to get there. Um, I realized this very early and also realized that I was going to have to work extremely hard in school to get to that point, which helped maintain my academics throughout elementary school, middle school, later high school, and now college. The second thing was that I loved science fair. I did two science fair projects in elementary school and really enjoyed the process of designing an experiment, conducting that experiment, analyzing the data, and then communicating that information to others. I also learned that math is not my strong subject, despite wanting to go into a very math heavy field. Um, I learned that I was going to have to work a lot harder in this field than my peers may have to. And there were definitely subjects that came easier to me, but math was not that subject. So I still continue to have to work harder in math than in some of my other courses. The fourth was that I'm certainly not athletic, and this actually helped me quite a bit to learn that sports were not my thing. This allowed me to later focus more on science fair and other extracurricular activities rather than dabbling in sports that I ultimately would not have enjoyed nor have been very good at. <laughs> The next portion of my life was middle school, and in middle school I allowed myself to kind of engage more in STEM. This top left picture is with the inventor of the Raspberry Pi, Evan Upton, and I had the opportunity to meet him as a result of Science Fair, but at the time I had a Raspberry Pi blog, um, which I operated as the Raspberry Pi Kid. You can find those blogs still today, and through this blog I documented my journey with the Raspberry Pi, and all of the little tricks that I found, any problems that I came across, I shared it with other students who were interested in learning about the Raspberry Pi. In middle school, I also joined my first robotics team. Um, robotics is really what allowed me to engage with engineering. We were given a task to make a robot for, we were given specific materials and a budget and a certain timeline, which really allowed me to understand what real engineers have to face when they're given a task. I also further pursued science fairs. You can see in the bottom three pictures. The left is me conducting some experiments with DNA and citrus psyllids. Um, this was a field I wasn't sure if I was interested in pursuing. So I went ahead and did a science fair project with biotechnology to allow me to understand if this is something I wanted to pursue further. I was also a Broadcom Master, which is a national science competition for middle school students um, in Washington, D.C. I met amazing people like Evan Upton through this competition, as well as former President Barack Obama and astronaut Jeanette Epps. 
which was an amazing opportunity and further confirmed that science fair was an outstanding thing for me to pursue um, further as I went into middle school and high school. This bottom picture is an example of one of my science fair projects in middle school, which utilized this DNA um, process that I was doing over here on the left. Some important things that I learned while in middle school, um, grades six through eight, is that science fair will provide me with outstanding life skills. Um, it provided me with technical skills like replicating DNA um, or calculating the lift generated by a hummingbird wing, but it also allowed me with skills in communication and writing up technical reports and documents, um, things that are outstanding and are done with practice. And so I was able to practice these through science fair. I also learned that robotics and Raspberry Pi both had elements that I was interested in. Um, robotics gave me engineering and engaging in the engineering design process. Raspberry Pi allowed me to tinker with electronics and practice using um, computer programming, which I ultimately discovered I was not interested in. And that allowed me to further pursue hands-on engineering rather than computer engineering. Um, that allowed me to help navigate my path and direct me more towards hardware rather than software. And the third thing was that if I want something, I was going to need to go out and get it myself. This really pertained to my interests outside of academics. In middle school, I got a lot more work that I had to do. I was involved in more extracurriculars. So if I wanted to um, go to a science museum or launch a model rocket, I was going to need to put in the work to make time for that. And it required time management abilities, prioritizing what was important to me. Um, and so these were all definitely things that I learned in this period that were applicable in high school and now. In high school, I really was able to explore STEM further and engage with other students that had similar passions. I continued doing science fair projects like you can see in this picture here. I competed in the California State Science Fair numerous times. Um, I presented my science fair at various conferences for other students who were interested in science fair. Um, I did more complex projects as the years went on, which allowed me to develop more skills and practice communicating higher level research. I competed in the International Science and Engineering Fair, which was a goal of mine um, while in middle school, and I was able to fulfill that goal in high school, which was very rewarding. I continued doing robotics. I was on many robotics teams and competed in the first world championship two times and the first super regional championship one time, which was an outstanding opportunity. Um, I attended Texas A&M's Camp Soar. Texas A&M was a college I was interested in, so this allowed me to learn more about the college, as well as the various areas of aerospace engineering, from airplanes to helicopters um, to dirigibles, you can see here, um, and everything in between, including rockets, which I dabbled with while in high school. This is a sugar rocket that I launched with some friends, and down here we have a model rocket that I launched with a group of Back to Space ambassadors in Texas. I was a National Center for Women in Information Technology Aspirations in Computing national and regional winner. Um, this was allowing me to further explore computer programming and dabble in computer engineering, which is a very useful skill in aerospace engineering. I was a Naval Surface Worker Center Corona intern, I worked in a measurement and calibration laboratory using high precision measuring devices to calibrate military gauges. And this allowed me to learn more about how measurements are made and how important the accuracy of those measurements are in, in this case, the military, but this is also very applicable in aerospace. I was a back to space ambassador throughout high school and got to attend many events, um, many high profile events, which gave me the opportunity to practice communicating with very intelligent people that I had had exposure to previously while in high school. And then I graduated high school with honors. I completed numerous college classes, which prepared me to move on to the next chapter of my life. Things I learned in high school are that relationships are incredibly important. I really prioritized relationships with my peers and relationships with those that I would meet at robotics competitions and science fair competitions. 
The next was that I learned that there's a lot more to college than the popularity of its name. Early in high school, I was aiming towards big name colleges because they had a big name. And yes, these schools have earned those titles with their programs. But for me, I really learned to prioritize how comfortable I would feel at these colleges, whether or not I'd fit into their culture, even the climate, if I would be happy with the weather I would experience um, during the four to five years that I would be in a college and so I learned to really look at more than just the name of the university. The third thing that I came to learn while in high school is that privilege comes in many forms. I really started to recognize my privilege while in high school. Um, I was fortunate enough to apply to every college that I wanted to apply to. I took standardized tests as many times as I needed to um, in order to obtain sufficient scores for the schools that I was applying to. And this is truly a privilege that I had. Not all students have that opportunity. Um, and so I really learned to recognize that privilege and be grateful for those privileges that I was born into. I continued to have amazing opportunities and to continue to pursue my passions for aerospace engineering. I was able to attend the Apollo 11 50th anniversary at Kennedy Space Center in Cape Canaveral, Florida with the Back to Space Ambassadors. It was a high profile event where I got to network with outstanding people. I met various astronauts, Neil deGrasse Tyson and more. It was truly an amazing opportunity. Further with the Back to Space Ambassadors, I had the opportunity to meet Walt Cunningham and Jean Kranz at a networking event, and they are both brilliant gentlemen that I got to hear from, and they are people that I've looked up to for many, many years. I joined clubs in college that allowed me to further pursue um, my love for space while also getting to meet new people um, in a new state, in a new college. And so here is a picture of me with a level one certification rocket through CU Boulder's Sounding Rocket Laboratory. This bottom picture here is of my dad and I getting ready to weld. Welding is a skill that I'm developing and working towards every day. And so I really took this up when college, designing new projects and making them become reality. I was fortunate enough to be awarded a scholarship from Lockheed Martin, as well as an internship through Lockheed Martin. Um, I would really like to work for this company upon graduation. And so this was a big step in my career. I don't have any pictures from my internship, but I was a Lockheed Martin Space intern for the GPS program. So this is an animation of what our satellites would look like from space. I have learned so many things since high school. The first one being that passion is a driving factor for motivation. I have faced a lot of difficulties since high school and ultimately have realized that if I wasn't passionate in what I was pursuing, I would not have gotten to the point where I am right now. I wouldn't have gotten through the very difficult classes. I wouldn't have made it through my very difficult internship if I didn't have a light at the end of the tunnel, which is pursuing this full time. The next thing I learned is that any relationship is an important relationship. In high school, I tended to prioritize relationships with people who were in the same field as me or had the same interests as me because I figured that those were the more beneficial relationships and learned after high school that that is not true whatsoever. Any relationship is an important relationship. Um, I actually received my internship through a connection with someone who has no ties to engineering. Um, he's in business and he helped me navigate my career and earn that internship at Lock. Key Martin. I also learned that a work-life balance is extremely necessary to prevent burnout. Um, for me, it's hiking. I go hiking a lot because school is difficult and internships are difficult. And sometimes you just need an outlet to escape that very intense technical engineering coursework. And so I think everyone should find the thing that allows them to escape from that very technical aspect of engineering. Again, for me, it's hiking, but for others, it may be art, music, so on and so forth. I have now recently started to dedicate more time to sharing these experiences with others through my Instagram and my blog. Um, here I document the difficulties I face in college, my experiences with Lockheed Martin. I share my passion for physics through physics lessons and science demonstrations, similar to the things that my dad showed me growing up. I want to provide to other students who may not have the privilege of having a physics teacher in their home to conduct these science demonstrations. I also have a blog where I share these experiences further and go into a little bit more depth than my Instagram posts. 
Thank you so much for listening to my talk today. Feel free to head over to my Instagram and ask me any questions um, of things you'd like to learn more from, or you can follow along my journey on my Instagram and Twitter there. In the Emirates, impossible is possible. Greetings of the day. I'm Ali Najim Nawaz, representing United Arab Emirates, studying in grade six, Alain Junior School. Today, I will enlighten you on UAE's mass mission, the Hope Probe. and its people's good fortune to have visionary leaders. This was only possible due to the visionary leader, the late Baba Sheikh Zayed bin Sultan Al Nahyan and the founding fathers of UAE. Hope Prob, the first Arab interplanetary mission. We aim for the UAE to be among the top countries in the field of aerospace by 2021. Quoted by Khalifa bin Zayed al Nahyan, the President of the United Arab Emirates. Facts about the Hope Probe. The Hope Probe is known as Al Amal in Arabic. The Hope Probe was launched by the Emirates Mars mission on 20th July 2020 at 12.58 a.m. Dubai time. It was launched 
at the Nigashima Space Center in Japan. The duration of the Mars mission is one Martian year, or about two Earth years. The Hope probe has an antenna, which is used to communicate, and is 1.85 meters long. It weighs about 1,350 kgs, including the fuel. It is equipped with a 600 watt solar panels to charge batteries. It has a dimension of 3 meters into 7.9 meters with the solar panels open. Purpose of the Hope Probe The Emirates Mars mission, Hope Probe, is tasked to provide the first ever complete picture of the Martian atmosphere. It will study daily and seasonal weather cycles, weather events in the lower atmosphere, such as dust storms in Mars. It will also attempt to find out why it is losing hydrogen and oxygen into space and other possible reasons. The Hope Probe is equipped with three sensors. First, Emirates Mass Infrared Spectrometer, EMIRS, which will study the lower atmosphere of the red planet in the infrared band. Second, Emirates Exploration Imager, EXI. It will study the lower atmosphere of the red planet in visible and ultraviolet bands. Emirates Mass Ultraviolet Spectrometer, EMUS. It will detect ultraviolet wavelength, determine the abundance and va variability of carbon monoxide and oxygen in the thermosphere on sub-seasonal timescales. It also has star trackers, which is used to determine its position in space by identifying the constellations in relation to the sun. Who's leading the UAE's mission to Mars? Her Excellency Sara Al-Amiri. She is an Emirati scientist. She is the Minister of State for Advanced Science in the Government of UAE, Chair of the UAE Space Agency, and Deputy Project Manager of the Emirates Mars Mission. It is interesting to know that 34% of the overall Emirates Mars mission team are women. 80% of Emirates Mars mission scientific team are women. May the UAE's heroine always inspire and reach for the stars. It was a nail-biting moment for the UAE space engineers at Mohammed bin Rashid Space Center in Dubai just before the mass orbit insertion. The mass orbit insertion was the toughest part of all. It had four scenarios. First scenario, at 7.30 p.m., the mass insertion orbit starts. This includes 27 minutes of burn, reducing speed from 121,000 to 18,000 kilometers per hour. Second scenario, loss of contact. No communication reaches us from Hope Prom. This can take 15 minutes or even two hours. Third scenario, spacecraft has six thrusters. If any of them fail, they will increase the time of reaching Mars. Fourth scenario, this is failure to enter and orbit around Mars. We surpass this stage. The Hope Probe successfully entered the Mars orbit on February 9th, 7.42 p.m. UAE time. And on the same day at 8.15 p.m., it was confirmed the Hope Probe entered the Mars orbit and it will remain there for two years. 50th year of independence, fifth nation to reach Mars, five million hours of hard work. This was a su success only because of the current UAE leaders, His Highness Sheikh Mohammed bin Rashid Al Maktoum, Vice President and Prime Minister of the UAE and Ruler of Dubai, and His Highness 
Sheikh Mohammed bin Zayed Al Nahyan, Crown Prince of Abu Dhabi and Deputy Supreme Commander of the UAE Armed Forces. They were personally present to congratulate the Emirates Mass Mission Team. Set no limits to your ambition and you can reach even to space. Thank you for joining me on UAE's journey to Mars.